Thanks. Cool. Well, uh, yeah, I'm Tamim Antoniades. I'm the co-founder and chief creative ninja at Ninja Theory. Um, so this talk is going to be console-centric because that's where my, uh, our experience and heritage lie. Um, and Ninja Theory has been going for about 14 years in the console space. We're about 100 devs. Uh, we are probably what you could call a mid-sized console developer in the AAA retail space. In other words, we're in that danger zone that lies between independent games and the big AAA franchises. And developers like us have had suffered something of a mass extinction event over the last generation or two. Um, and it seems like things are going to get worse, not better, unless we find another way forward. Uh, and yes, it's true that retail is, is predicted to grow over the next few years, but most of that growth is going to be swallowed up by the massive franchises. Uh, and for everyone else, it's just going to get harder and uh, it'll get worse than it has been in the last. So why is that? Now, despite an unprecedented digital gaming revolution, big publishers are very much still reliant on the, on the fixed price $60 uh, retail model. Uh, and this has been true ever since the PlayStation 1, I would say, where because of the fixed price uh, of, the, of the product, competition focuses on, on feature lists and, and getting bigger. Like, so it's, it's, it's not so much uh, survival of the fittest as it is survival of the fattest. Um, we're in a world where, for some, uh, selling three or four or five million is still considered a failure. Uh, and this list, this list I've got up here is the list of everything a AAA retail game has to have in order to be viable. Not to be successful, but just to be a viable proposition. So what happens to the developers who are not fat enough? So many have packed it in and started over in mobile gaming, indie gaming, or other areas. Others have been absorbed into publishers who don't want to bet 50 to 100 million dollars on an external studio. And most have simply gone bust. We've survived by focusing on quality, uh, staying on budget, shipping on time, but then so have many of the other developers on this list. So I guess we've hey, just been lucky. Bastards. I'm still here. We, we have taken several near-fatal wound, wounds along the way, and it's not something we want to have going forward. Is that on my forehead? So where do we go from here? Papillon made it to freedom. And for the remaining years of his life, he lived a free man. <laughs> so yes, it's true that many developers have moved on to better things, but talented teams that have worked together for many, many years have been broken up forever. Uh, years of knowledge in AAA game making is, has been lost along the way. And our talent pool for AAA game development, particularly in the UK, has been uh, shrinking. Uh, and s graduates are there to fill the gap, but they're not always coming out of university with the necessary skills for us to move forward. So it might seem uh, futile to try and reverse this trend, but within our limited power, we're going to try something. Um, and key to, key to that, key to trying to make it work, is to be open about it from the very beginning. So I have an analogy here. There were, in 2010, two movies came out which made the same amount of money, approximately 300 and, or just over $300 million in profit post-recoup. Uh, one was Black Swan, one was Clash of the Titans. One was creatively risky, uh, but low budget, and the other one was big and dumb. And I actually asked the publisher outright which of these bets were they more comfortable with and it wasn't Black Swan. So I, I believe that this idea that you have to go big or go home uh, to be a fallacy. I, I think it was proved a fallacy when the indie gaming scene took off. And I think it's going to, so now the story goes that you can either be indie or AAA and there's nothing in between. And I believe that that is also going to be proved a fallacy. So, for want of a better phrase, I'm calling this space between indie and AAA, uh, independent AAA. Uh, 
it's a place for developers like us who don't fit comfortably in, in the big mega budget AAA world, uh, but we're not indies either. Uh, it's about self-publishing AAA quality that's narrow in focus, uh, but at a fair price and connecting to your fans in a meaningful way. Uh, by, selecting, by, by selling games directly to uh, players digitally, uh, we can pass on the, the bang for buck to them directly instead of all the middlemen. So just as, this is just a note on terminology. I was speaking to Lorne Lanning from Oddworld uh, earlier this year at GDC, and he, was, he described this space. He, he coined the term AAA indie, which I really like. But I'm using the more neutral, independent AAA term because there's a particular culture and ethos that surrounds the word indie, which we're not part of. Uh, we haven't earned that. Uh, but as for Lorne, he's put his money where his mouth is. He's released an excellent game at a, at a mid-middle, uh, for the price of a movie, really. Uh, and I wish him and his team the, the, the best of success in the future because I think that this is an important place for us. So our core proposal is to make a game that looks and feels AAA, uh, but it's smaller. It's got focused gameplay, it's sold for the price of buying a movie, um, and it puts the game developer at the center and in direct relationship with the player. In effect, this is the indie publishing model uh, with AAA execution. So in early summer, I took aside a very small team, uh, by AAA standards, I guess, and worked up an idea for a game and development strategy. So we worked on this for about a month, and then we decided that if we're going to be open about it, we need to announce as soon as we can. So with a small team of 10, and in eight weeks, we produced this trailer in Unreal Engine 4 and announced it at the Sony press conference at Gamescom. I mean, it's a testament to the talent of the team members that created that trailer, but also a testament to the maturity and productivity of, the, the, of tools and middleware these days. So our strategy is to chuck out as much of the bag, bug it, uh, baggage that comes with AAA retail and focus on the areas that we love. Um, this is, and, and this isn't about world do domination either. I mean, if we can carve out a place for ourselves and make the kinds of games that we want to make, and we're we feel passionate about, uh, and in the process, earn a decent quality of life, 
uh, I think we'll have hit our creative we, uh, sweet spot. But if other developers also do this, and we turned a mid-sized game into something big uh, again, I think, I think we're going to have a much healthier industry, a much he healthier ecosystem, and better games. So here's our approach. Um, budgets for games in the last generation have kind of varied between 20 million and 100 million plus. Uh, our previous games have always been on the low, low end of that, uh, of that scale. But even, even, even then, Hellblade is a tiny fraction of even our cheapest game that we've ever developed. Uh, in effect, we were winding the clock 20 years and doing Hellblade for the cost of producing a console game around 1995. And yet, for us, the biggest obstacle remains funding, as there is no established uh, funding model in this space. So how are we funding it? We're putting up most of the funding ourselves. Uh, we, we, for the rest, we're pursuing several strategies, including grants, tax breaks, uh, loans. And for the first time in our history, we own the IP. Uh, so we're going to start taking our first steps towards setting up simple steps, like setting up an online shop. So if we make money from there, like selling things that our, we think our fans want, uh, it'll only make the game better and bigger. And after we release Hellblade, we're going to publish uh, what, what we've learned in terms of the business model, some facts and figures. And the idea is that other developers can take our data and use that as a basis to uh, make decisions on their own games. If those developers then also publish it, then I think it could turn into something. And my, uh, in an ideal world, I, I'd like publishers to be filling this gap, funding gap. So in the meantime, we are adapting everything we know about game making, trying to make it work faster, cheaper, and, and generally work smarter. Middleware's matured massively, uh, allowing us to focus on the art and craft. Each, each member of the team is being stretched way beyond their specializations. And we're, we're taking a lot of creative risks because we know that we cannot compete on scale. Uh, and so we're using our full knowledge in, in, and experience in AAA games making to make something that would have seemed impossible even a few years ago. And it's thrilling. It's really fun. It's really fun to go into work and face these challenges. So we're, shelling, we're sharing our journey through our website, hellblade.com. We've got a freelance video editor in-house, uh, filming, interviewing, editing. Since we announced about just over a month ago, we've done four making of video blogs. We've released entire design documents of previous games online. Uh, and we're going to carry on doing this for the entirety of the development. Now, revealing a game this early is an aberration in a world where games are announced closer to completion. Uh, we're making, making of videos look back at development with rose-tinted glasses. Uh, but for us, the journey isn't a retroactive marketing tool. It's, it's part of the Hellblade experience. So an initiative we're putting together imminently is a Ninja Masterclass program. It's a team-wide endeavor not at Ninja Theory, not just the Hellblade team. And the idea is to share in-depth knowledge on how we make games to anyone and any institution to use as they wish. We're doing this because we want to create a healthy pool of talent for, the medium to, for our medium to long-term future, but also because we want to achieve some of the things that we've seen in presentations earlier, like that Blizzard's doing with Hearthstone or, or Devolver has been doing with their fan base. Uh, so if we can train up a pool of talent to create things, it's a, we think that there'll be future benefits to that. And I'm pleased to say that we're not the only ones. Um, Epic has very similar goals, and we're intending to work with them to make this happen. Uh, Epic has a very large community of developers, and they've just released Unreal Engine free for all of their students, for all students. So with their involvement, we can reach uh, universities, students, hobbyists. Uh, more than anything, it feels really good for us, our team members, to be sharing their knowledge. Now, our team is also exploring new ways to work uh, more efficiently. For example, 
There were some clips in the, in the, in the trailer there, but we've been inventing prototype hardware uh, that, we've, that members of our team have been putting together for less than a few hundred pounds to do jobs that would ordinarily cost many, many thousands of pounds to, to do. We have to think smaller, smarter, so we're forced to invent. Uh, and in due course, we'll be sharing this knowledge so other, other developers, hobbyists, can build their own stuff. Uh, the idea, general principle behind all of this is that if we all share, we all benefit in the long term. We're a creative industry and we should be competing on creativity, not on technology. So I'm also very pleased to say that Vicon are on board with helping us. We were the first studio uh, to use performance capture in a video game with Heavenly Sword way back in 2005. Uh, and we did that in, uh, we, we developed our real-time systems in collaboration with Weta Digital. Um, and I was actually there at Weta when, uh, stood next to Peter Jackson, when he was demonstrating the real-time performance capture tech to James Cameron using Heavenly Sword assets. And that technology has spread like wildfire in the, in, in the movie industry, but not so much in the games industry. It's still a relatively rare thing. I think studios believe it's too expensive and too complex to do. Um, I believe that performance capture is, not only gives you amazing quality, but it's, it can be done far, it's, it's a far quicker and cheaper way of producing cutscenes than any other competing method. And so we want to prove that on a modest budget, we can do this for Hellblade with Vicon's uh, assistance and help. So Hellblade will be our proving ground to this, and we'll be sharing that. So, and one of our most important changes we're making is that we're going to invite players into our world. We're going to uh, invite players to help us test, balance, and give feedback during game development. It's something that's very common in the indie space. It's, it's not in, in the console space. Um, it's, so, it's something that we've always been passionate about doing, but under the standard publishing model, there's a lot of secrecy, and it's very difficult to do this. One other benefit is if you're open from the start, there's less chances of leaks, because you're leaking all the way through the game. So there are a great many reasons to be open about development. And as we work through this model, I'm acutely aware that things can fail, and things cannot go as you expect, and things can turn sour. Um, I have been on the receiving end of some of that in previous games, so I know what it feels like to have an internet, an online hate mob, uh, turn their attention onto you. But if things go wrong, I think that's OK, too, because others will learn from us, or our mistakes, rather, um, pick up the gauntlet and do things better. Hellblade is an effort to make game development a fun, exciting, and open process. It's not a drip-fed PR-controlled strategy. It's real life. You know, if things can go wrong. It's not always rosy. But, but I can say this, from the first announcement, well, from the first Sony Gamescom's announcement to, these, to Epic's involvement, to Vicon support, so far, nothing but good has come from this approach. So thank you. <laughs>